Morning, everybody. I'm going to tear into a new lecture here. It's probably going to take me a couple days to get through this, but, um, so, well, wait, I, I need to back up. First of all, we get to go back to school Monday, and frankly, that's awesome. Um, another housekeeping item. I kicked an assignment out to you folks or a discussion board about, um, what, what what we're going to do as far as vaccinating goes at, at branding time. And if you come from an outfit that you don't necessarily brand calves or there's not a big function called a branding, don't worry about it. I, I just mean when those calves are still pretty young, most people are going to work or mark those cattle or, or something, whatever you call it. So what I was asking about there was, if you're going to vaccinate, what are you going to do? And and what are the diseases you're going to vaccinate for? I think that's probably a pretty important discussion. So if you folks would take a look at that discussion board and um, let your classmates know what you're thinking there. And I don't know exactly what day we're going to do it, but I'm going to use those responses in class and we'll start from there on a branding discussion. Um this lecture I'm working into now, it's going to take me a couple days to peel through. Um, I think if you stood to learn anything from me at your entire time at college, probably this PowerPoint presentation, it's going to have the most lasting effect on anything I have to teach you. Um, so that being said, when I work through this, um, there's going to be something akin to a test. Uh, basically, I'm going to ask you to apply what we talked about in this PowerPoint presentation to something to do with the operation that you either come from or one that you're going to, or I guess failing that, put put a cow outfit in your mind's eye or a business for that matter. Um, everything I'm going to talk about, you can apply it to whatever. Um, I, I'm definitely going to tailor make it towards cattle though. So, all right, here we go. Um, why I'm calling this the squeeze will become apparent as we kind of work our way through this. So to set the stage a little bit, if, if we're going to be ranchers and we're going to be beef producers let's just start at the very very beginning and get as basic as we can and and it'll become apparent why i'm setting it up this way uh, as we go along but um if we're going to have a ranch what do we need if i told you we need three things to have a ranch what do you think those three things are so really, I'm, I'm asking you to make a list in your head. What are the three things we need to have on our ranch? So I am going to lay it out this way. Let's start with money. Um, there's nothing gets done without money or at least the ability to spend money. You may not have it. You may be borrowing it. But we got to have money. Uh, that That's what lets us trade for other things that we need for a ranch. So if I start there with money, what what is... I, I'm hoping somebody comes up with one of the couple of the next things that we're going to need. So how about a ranch? <laughs> right we we we, we kind of got to have a ranch to get this done so that just opens an entire can of worms um and i i hope to work through a couple of those things that we need to decide so does anybody have anything on their top three lists that we haven't got to yet i am going to suggest that if we're going to have a cattle ranch maybe we ought to have some cattle there we go and, of course, they're going to be Red Angus cattle because we all know those are the best cattle. Um, we need those three things. So let's kind of start talking about what we're going to work with. Let's take the money first. So, first of all, where, where are we going to get money? Um, the, there are a couple ways, and, and I'm... 
probably going to put some things to you that you hadn't necessarily thought of before, but you're getting to the point in your life where you're going to have to think about this. Um, please remember this one. Off the, I mean, this one should be front of your brain. But cash is always the best. And I don't necessarily mean like in that picture, you know, $100 bills in a, you know, pillowcase hid under a bed somewhere or something like that. Um, but something you can convert into cash or, or dollars at least in a bank account, that's always going to be the best. Uh, and, and by that I mean when we go and seek financing on something, the banker's favorite term is they say cash is king. Um, you, you can go anywhere, do anything with cash. So if you're ever given the opportunity to buy something and have something versus have the cash, I'm going to tell you nine times out of ten, having the cash is going to allow you to execute plans better than having equity in a pickup or something like that. Um, here's another one that might slap a couple of you across the face like a wet fish, but off-ranch income. Um, of the ranchers that you know in your life, how many of them have a spouse or they, in fact, themselves have a pretty good paying job in town. Um, the fact of the matter is about 80% of ranches in the United States definitely not only get but rely on off-ranch income. That means somebody's got a job in town. Here's the one that I think is probably probably the, one of the worst things that's happening in the ranching world right now, or, or even agriculture for that matter, but collateralizing the existing place. Long story short, let me explain it like this. Everybody's watched and heard about home values going up, particularly in the last decade. Uh, that That's just an undeniable fact. Well, right along with that value of a house in town somewhere, the value of your ranch has gone up. Whether you did anything good with that ranch or not, just the fact that that is privately deeded acres that somebody else could buy and do something with has made the value of that ranch, in some cases, just absolutely explode. Um, in other cases, it's just kind of ticked right on up. What a lot of farms and ranches are choosing to do, and this is also financing their expansion or updating technology and equipment or paying down other debt, whatever the case may be, um, a lot of times these folks are going to town and they're basically mortgaging or remortgaging the ranch. And in doing so, they take the current market value of it and it allows them to borrow more money against the value of that place. Um, don't get me wrong, that is definitely a tool that's at your disposal to get a hold of cash. I'm going to say please, please be very aware of what you're doing. That is exactly the same thing as walking down to a real estate office and saying, I want to buy a ranch. When I put it to you that way, there's a lot of you that go, well, I can't afford to do that. I can't pay for buying a ranch with a set of cows. And in point of fact, you're probably right if that's your attitude. So why do we have a different attitude when we say, well, I need cash. I'm going to go mortgage the place. That, that's, I mean, the, the mechanics of it are exactly like you started fresh and just went and bought one. Um, Here's the other source of money that um, comes along quite a bit, and that's inherit it. Um, there's a particularly nasty saying in the cow business says the only way to get a hold of a ranch is by the womb, the tomb, or the altar, meaning you're either born into it, somebody dies and gives it to you, or you marry into it. Um, unfortunately, that's very, very true, but it does not have to be that way. So... Those are some of the, you know, more common ways of laying hands on cash. Um, the next thing to talk about for almost all of us is, is that 
we all live and operate in a business that requires so much money to be tied up in what you're using to get any production oftentimes that leaves us without any cash and I'm, I'm going right back to buying a ranch I would assume every penny you ever have had or ever will have is tied up in buying that ground um, and that's just the low-hanging fruit example there's a lot of other stuff we tie our money up in like pickups and horse trailers and horses and dogs all of those things aren't making any money for us they're they're not writing any checks to us nonetheless those are the things we've told ourselves that we got to have in order to produce and, and get something that writes checks for us so the fact of the matter is, is a lot of us are actually going to have to go to a bank in order to get pat cash to pay our bills uh, i mean the electricity bill is still due you still got to buy hay for those cows whether your money's all tied up in something else or not so when we do that the first thing you need to understand is the interest um, interest is the time value of money that is a rental cost for using somebody else's money you have to pay all of what you borrowed back, of course, and then they're going to charge you for the privilege of using it. Um, something I did pick up at that ranching for profit school, and, and I wish I'd have learned to think of it in these terms earlier in my life, but you take the prime interest rate today, and, and I almost guarantee any one of you could walk down to a bank and get a personal loan right now, and they'd probably charge you somewhere around 5 or 6% interest to do that. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and calculate interest closer to 10%. What they're not advertising, and when I say they, banks, what banks aren't advertising to you is the all of the loan fees surrounding borrowing money right now. It, it actually becomes burdensome very, very quickly. Another thing I'll tell you in agriculture, you probably haven't heard this, is Almost everybody, unless you have, say, a trust fund sitting out there somewhere that can cover 100% of the loan, banks and agriculture are going to ask you to buy loan insurance on that, and that just becomes one of the fees in getting that loan. A lot of those are going to start running 2 3 4% of the actual loan fee. Then the bank, because on TV you've all seen it, well, we're not charging for a checking account, and we've got super friendly tellers that know what they're doing, and all these services a bank offers, they can't do that for free. And while they have these, banks have these other sources of income, like every time you write a bad check, they charge you 25 or 45 bucks or whatever, that isn't their main profit driver. Their main profit driver is every time they write a loan, they're sticking you for these fees. And it sounds very official-like and, and all this, but it boils down to interest rates are so stinking low right now that banks can't make a living just on rent and money. They, they can't do it, and there's too much competition. So they start stacking these fees on every time you loan, you borrow money. So I'm going to tell you, Probably your effective interest rate by time you pay back all these other things associated with borrowing money. Pro today, probably take whatever interest they say they're going to lend you money at, double that, and you're probably going to be pretty close to the truth right then. Um, there you go. Uh, another thing that we'll pick up depreciation a little bit later. But when we start talking about borrowing money and what kinds of money we have, we generally are going to split that into a couple of different categories. Capital money, in, in this instance, capital refers to purchases of things that are, are meant to be durable or meant to be around for a long time. So a really great example of that is buying a track. You intend that tractor to be around for the next 15 or 20 years. Certainly buying a piece of dirt or a house 
or a barn or something like that. Those are the things that you need to have to produce. Oftentimes, if you borrow money to buy those things, it's going to be on what they call a term note. So they're, they're going to ask you to pay back putting that barn up for the next five or seven or 20 years, whatever the case may be. Then we talk about operating money. Operating money is paying for the Monday, day-to-day -day type stuff. Got to pay the electricity bill this month. Um, Got to fix a tire on the pickup. Got to put a new clutch in the pickup. Got to buy hay to feed the cows this winter. That's operating money. Um, the banks, and certainly yourself, should distinguish between those two things. Um, you would love, if you were borrowing, you'd love to not borrow to start with, but um, the banks are going to handle those very, very differently. Oftentimes, you're going to have to pay way more interest on operating money than capital money. Okay, if we're going to start talking about the ranch now, so that, that was just a little broadside about money real quick. If we're going to start talking about the ranch, if I ask you if there's two general ways to get this done, and by done I mean have a ranch, what what two different ways have we got? And because we're not looking at each other, it's kind of hard for me to lead this conversation, especially when I can't hear anybody talking to me. But what I'm getting at is you absolutely have the choice to either rent, a ranch, lease it, whatever you want to call it, or we can purchase it or own it. So if I asked you folks, what are some of the things about renting a ranch that you like or dislike? Let's just kind of have a, a list about that. Um, for you as the ranch operator, it is probably going to be cheaper. Um, you are not going to have to rent a ranch necessarily according to what the purchase price or, you know, I guess same thing as what the, the actual market value of that ranch is. Um, it is almost always an impossibility to ask cows to make land payments. It, it, it just mathematically is not possible. Um, so uh, without trying to make too much comment on what you ought to be leasing a ranch for, um, I, suffice it to say that renting it is probably going to be the cheaper of your two options, particularly if you're just doing a head-to-head -head comparison between renting and buying, which one is going to have a lower monthly payment, if we put it that way. Um, here's another cool thing about leasing a ranch rather than buying it. Is that expense tied up with the land? So if you're leasing a ranch, that's going to be a big old giant whopping payment, right? If you're renting it, you get to deduct that from your income. Whereas if you're buying it, you have to pay taxes. You personally have to pay taxes on that money before you can use it to uh, make a land payment. Whereas rent, I get to take that off of my taxes. So that's a serious benefit right there. Renting it is pretty flexible too. And the, the examples I'm going to give, I'm, please be aware that with these examples, that's emergency or extraordinary circumstances that you would do this. But if there was a grass fire or a forest fire came through and burned the ranch down that you're leasing, you just don't lease it, right? You just let it go. Say, well, there's no grass here. There is, in fact, not a ranch here this year. I'm not going to do it. Same thing with a drought. Or if the cattle market just goes totally wonky one way or the other and you don't want any part of it, that's fine. You have the flexibility to just say, nope, I'm out. Whereas... If you signed up to purchase a ranch, you own that sucker. You and mostly you own the payment on it. So you get a whole whopping amount of flexibility if you're leasing it. Um, 
you know, somebody would step up and say, well, you don't just turn a loose a lease loose, and, and that's right. But if push came to shove and it came down to my financial survival versus doing the right thing or being a good guy to the landowner, I'm pretty sure I'm going to take care of my family first. Um, another one, and, and this is totally how you have your lease arranged, but a lot of ranches have some sort of an elevator or a decreaser in it to where the landowner has some skin in the game and the landowner is actually going to take over some profit sharing. Also, they have some loss sharing when it comes down to it. So, and then the last one, and anybody who's tried to lease a ranch is going to look at me like I uh, grew a purple horn out of my forehead, but there's probably more availability out there to lease something than there is by it. Um, of this much, I am sure. They don't make any more dirt. Um, finding a place to go buy can be a little bit difficult, especially if you put a caveat on it find one to buy that I can afford, that I can actually ranch on, that may be pretty akin to a, a unicorn. So there you go. There, There's my little list about renting. But what are some of the things about buying it? So this first one is undeniable. I started part of this conversation by saying, yeah, land values have been going up. And in fact, in a lot of places, they're going up exponentially or they're just utterly exploding. Um, if you can figure out a way to make the payments on it in the meantime, land has almost always been a super good investment over the long haul. Meaning the day you say you're done, that ground is going to be worth substantially more than what you paid for. Uh, so that comes into a discussion down the road when we start splitting out the different enterprises that we actually are managing if, if we're on a ranch. A portion of that value that you're buying, maybe even the biggest portion of it, might have to go into a completely different company that you own that is the land part of the company. Everybody's re read those ranch signs that say such and such land and cattle company. There you go. Those businesses have made the decision that the cattle are going to lease the ground from me. I'm the owner of it. I also own a land company and some other source of income is going to have to make the lion's share of those land payments. There you go. Here's another thing about buying it. It's mine. Nobody can tell me what to do on it. Well, the government's sure going to try. The thing about it is I don't have to listen to anybody tell me how many cattle I can have, where and when. I, I don't have to follow anybody else's rules. And I, I will be honest with you, there's a certain degree of pride that goes with saying, no, this is my place, that's mine. That's part of my goals. That's that. That's a huge part of what I wanted to be able to do w while I was playing this game. Um, the other thing that's undeniable about owning it is there is certainly a large degree of increased stability and ability to plan. Um, you don't have to have been around very long. And it's either it's happened to you or certainly somebody you know well has said, well, so-and-so took the lease from me. And all of a sudden, their best laid plans are, are just a, a wreck now. When you own it, that isn't going to happen. So there are definitely pros and cons of both renting and buying and the only thing I know for certain on all of this is I will not have an answer for you and what your goals are and the situation you've got dealing with that decision about whether I should rent it or, or buy it. There you go. All right. So we talked about the money. We talked about the dirt a little bit. Now let's talk about the cattle. Okay. So 
this automatically is going to spur some pretty tough questions. What should, I mean, what to have? Um, do, do I have cows? Um, do I have yearlings? Do I have something that doesn't look like any of my other neighbors because I've got some sort of competitive advantage on the ranch that I'm dealing with right now? Um, a, a l less difficult question to answer is where to go get them. Um, there are cattle available. Always. There's always cattle available. You just need to know where to look. And by that, I mean, you know, need to know who to talk to to go find them. They are out there. It can be done. They make semis that haul cattle around every day. That's not that big of a deal. So what type of cattle do I need to have? And I'm certainly not trying to get off into the weeds about you should own red Angus cattle or anything right now. Um, then, I mean, some of these questions you're having to answer all at the same time is, is are we matching the cattle I've got to the environment I've got? And also, I, I'm referring to the production cycle. Um, am I asking a cow to do something that just doesn't make sense at a certain time of year because of where she's at in her production cycle? Um, so, yeah, am I running the right class and kind of cattle? Um, but here, here's the biggest question, and, and this is actually going to answer all the rest of them. What is it going to cost to have that critter? And... and I'm sorry if I made it sound like you should own cows. Um, I, I should say cattle. Um, that That's not nearly as descriptive. So, All right. Um, I'm just going to start this because I'm about to chew up my half an hour. But we've talked about this a little bit before, and I'm just going to come back to it really quickly. And then uh, tomorrow we're going to start into what happens to a balance sheet when we start making moves on a ranch. So I'm just going to end today with going over what a balance sheet is. You'll hear some people call it an equity sheet. Some people call it a balance sheet and other people call it a statement of net worth. It all means exactly the same thing. It basically depends upon what bank you're standing at, what they're going to call it. So they're all getting at exactly the same thing. Over on the left hand, column of that, you're going to have your assets. We're going to break assets into current and non-current assets. So let me give you an example of, let me start with non-current assets. Non-current asset would be like your house, your ranch, um, probably your pickup, probably your cows. Um, that means that something that's something that you don't intend to sell, at least in the short term, um, and things you don't in, I, I don't want to put these hard, hard rules on it, but like your cows, we all know that some of your cows are going to get old and age out. So there's a certain amount of them we are going to sell, but things outside of the, the normal course of business, um, those are the things you have no intention to sell probably within the next year. And in point of fact, it'd be pretty difficult to do an effective job of selling whatever that asset is for maximum value within the next year. Um, you know, if you did want to sell 40 acres off of your ranch, it would be extremely difficult for you to get maximum value and make sure everything was right and get that done within the next 30 days. So that's your non-current assets. Your current assets are things that can be very, very quickly converted into cash. So an example of that would be if you're sitting there in August and you have a calf crop that you intend to wean in October and sell them, definitely a current asset. If you have a pile of hay sitting there that you could put wheels under and sell it just as good tomorrow as you could 80 days from now, there's a current asset. Um, <coughs> the biggest reason why we split those two up is that current um, definitely includes cash. And that speaks to how able are you to make a payment in the next 365 days. Cool? 
All it does is it totals up what you got. Then we've got our liabilities over on the top right. Liabilities is what you owe. So we're going to break that up into current and long term. Kind of follows the same rules as the assets, but of course this is a debt over here. Um, so you've got current liabilities, electricity bills due. Got to buy a pile of hay or, you know, bought a pile of hay but haven't paid for it. Um, the portion of your pickup payment that's going to be due in the next 12 months. A lot of the just normal course of business type liabilities you're going to come into. <laughs> or debts. Or, yeah, good enough. Then your long term is going to be like, the tractor payment or the mortgage payment you got out there. So often terms that is oftentimes that is very structured debt and says you gotta pay X amount per year, per month, whatever the case may be, over the next twenty years, whatever. Then my net worth or my equity, all I'm gonna do is total up all of these assets and then subtract out what all the liabilities are. And really what that's telling you is how much do we own? We don't owe money on it. Or how much of the value of all of that ranch and all that it does minus all the things that that ranch owes money on. That's how much is the ranch and owned by somebody. So that's the balance sheet. Please understand a couple of things about this balance sheet. If you and I were to prepare one right now, it's literally good for the next 30 seconds. Any time a value of your ranch changes, you spend money, you get money, whatever, this balance sheet changes. So it is only a snapshot. Um, and if you're just looking at the bottom line of it, oftentimes it's not telling nearly complete enough of a story to make any valid judgments off of a balance sheet only. Make no mistake, this is the first thing what, that the bank is going to ask for, so you need to understand it and do it. Also understand it is a tool. It, it does not tell the complete story. All right, I used up my time for the day. I'm so excited I only got to do one more of these suckers hiding behind my computer, and then I get to have folks in the classroom. So. Please, please let me see you all Monday. Thank you.